I just want to tell you a few things about like how um, how you might think about approach learning in, a, in an unfamiliar topic. So I'm going to reveal to you a secret that as recently as a year ago, I thought that, okay, let me back up. So my, my own school path was I started as an undergrad at Boston University in 2001 as a biomedical engineering major. It's what we call bioengineering at, uh, at Boston University. And then the second week of my undergraduate career, 9-11 happened, and it completely blew up my world. Um, I didn't want to have anything to do with technology or, or, uh, or like kind of hard in like, uh, like hard sciences, engineering. And I actually switched my major to anthropology. <laughs> I switched my major because I wanted to understand how people, uh, how people behaved and why, what their motivations were. And so I thought, okay, social sciences. And I, I did the biological anthropology track, so like um, how you know, gene and culture coevolution and that kind of stuff got me in, interested in sort of scientific philosophy. Um, I had a really good chemistry teacher as a, a chemistry professor as a, an undergraduate, and so I switched my major to biochemistry. Then I changed my major to straight up chemistry because there were a lot of pre-med students in my biochemistry classes and I couldn't keep up with them because they just memorized everything. Uh, I wish this weren't recorded, but probably only engineers are watching this. Raise your hand if you're pre-med. Okay, the story gets, uh, gets more sympathetic to you folks in just a minute. And so, uh, and I, I, I dropped my engineering courses. I, I went down to 12 units my first semester. Uh, we had the semester system at BU, as opposed to the core system. But then uh, I switched to biochemistry or biological anthropology, then biochemistry, then straight up chemistry, and then I added a, a minor in physics by the end. So um, I don't know, that was the closest thing to like chemical engineering that Boston University offered because they didn't offer a chemical engineering uh, degree. I was also pre met when I started. But then when I got into like 10 years into my research career, I was doing a lot of NIH panels. So the National, Sci or National Institutes of Health, which has like an almost $40 billion research budget that they sort of dole out competitively to professors at universities to do their research to employ graduate students and postdocs and to purchase supplies and publish and travel and you know do all their experiments. And so I, um, on a, uh, and so I'm very sensitive to caffeine. And one time um, in 2014, I, uh, I saw this opportunity called the uh, the NIH Director's New Innovator Award, which is probably the only NIH grant that new uh, that engineering faculty can actually have a chance of getting. So. I had a fully caffeinated latte, and I had been a decaf, you know, old before, and I was just so tripped up on this latte that I'm like, I can apply for this, and I thought I can get it, even though it had a 5% acceptance rate. And so I, as fast as possible, like, like um, sketched out a draft of this proposal, and it was going to involve um, electronic polymers, which is actually related to what I eventually will get to today after my uh, monologue. Um, electronic polymers that had, uh, that interfaced with the human nervous system and, you know, creating these biomedical devices that could sense mechanical motion, chemical, uh, uh, chemical effects, um, provide haptic interactions, and I got it. I got that grant, and it was $2.3 million, and it changed my life. And after that, um, I was invited to these National Institute, Institutes of Health grant review meetings where other people submitted their ideas, and I would read them, and then we would go to Washington, D.C. and sit around the table and discuss these ideas. 
and I was on the instrumentation and systems development study section, which is where all the biomedical devices go. And I'm like, I'm a biomedical engineer again. <laughs> so I was then officially kind of like recognized by the National Institutes of Health as being an expert in biomedical engineering after you know, 15 years uh, after I had like renounced my uh, my uh, or original degree aim as a high school senior when I applied to BU as a biomedical engineer. But then I noticed that grant proposals that I had written afterwards were not getting reviewed so well. Like when I was, because I could only apply for this, you know, early, this, 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 Two point three million dollar thing once. I got one shot. There was no applying for it again. After you get it again, or after you get it once, you have to home in on what your specialty is going to be, and you have to compete with people in the community, like other professors who have been doing that kind of work for a long time. And your work has to be very clinically relevant. It has to. It can't just be like high minded. We're going to make bionic whatever. Like, it has to be very clinically relevant. So, uh, so what I found is that most of these engineering and medicine proposals that I were reviewing, the less successful ones were like, an engineer comes up with something that they think is really awesome. They ask someone in their medical school, do you want to try this on, on a human cohort or animal co cohort or something? And they say, yeah, yeah, I could use 30% of your budget if I just write a letter saying that I'll, I'll do it if it gets funded. And that disconnect between the engineers and the clinicians was a weak point in a lot of these proposals. The ones that were really successful were when the clinicians had a lot of engineering experience themselves, like in an MD-PhD degree or something, or when the, the engineering investigator was had had a long history of interacting with this clinician and they spoke the same language and there was a there was a a dovetailing there was a confluence of language and it was pretty clear that they wrote the grant together or at least spoke the same language as opposed to here's the engineering part and yeah yeah it might have some biomedical relevance so i thought last year, wouldn't it be cool if I didn't sleep for four years and did an MD in the background? And I rocked this idea back and forth in my mind, like how could I possibly do it with a kid as associate dean for students, with a research lab, with a teaching uh, you know, profession? And eventually, I convinced myself and my wife convinced me that it was impossible and to forget about it. But what I did was I got a bunch of MCAT books and I got a bunch of US medical licensing exam books and I taught myself enough to speak the language of my medical collaborators that I use in the field. And that still took a lot of work and I'm still doing it now. I have my, my textbooks at home that when I have some time I'll like actually go through and study. And the, the, the moral of the story is like I'm teaching students nanoengineering and then I'm going home and seeing if I can actually walk the walk and like learn myself a new topic that I had no clue about before. And so I'm going to tell you a few of the things that I do now after 39, so pre, I don't know, 34 years of school um, that, uh, that I finally came to that might help you uh, as well. So, uh, so treat studying as learning. which is an active process. I don't even like the word studying. 
studying to me means that you're sitting at a desk and you have nothing in your hand, hands except the book is on the desk and you're flipping through pages and you're like, oh, that paragraph has a lot of words I've never seen before in it, but eh, they'll explain it in class. Or I read it a second time at a moderate speed. Still doesn't really make sense. I get halfway through it and I start hearing a song in my head. And I'm like, oh, that's a good song. And then your eyes go over the words and you get to the end of the paragraph. And you're like, I didn't actually read any of those words, although my eyes had looked at every word. Then you read it a third time and still the same thing. At least that's how I read when I'm trying to study. The alternative is to always learn with a pen in hand and you write your learning diary. Diary kind of, I mean, it's like, you know, when you're an angsty teenager and like you put it under your bed or something and whatever. This is this is a grown up, <laughs> grown up diary. Although, yeah, um, journaling is still very helpful for mental health and everything. Okay, this is your your learning diary. So your learning diary is you're treating the what goes in your learning diary jargon. free explanations so you read it you learn the jargon by looking at the glossary or on Google and you write a jargon free explanation then you define jargon and you write down all your questions. Your textbook author, me included, as you may notice, cannot anticipate all of your questions. And they may assume that something is in there because we, as textbook authors, suffer from the curse of knowledge. We assume that everyone comes in with the same lexicon and jargon as we do, which they don't. Um, like when I'm reading my MCAT study materials in neuroscience textbook and US NLE licensing exam review books, they don't know what I don't know, right? And so they can't necessarily meet me halfway. The advantage of being in a course with human beings as opposed to just <coughs> reading a book is that you have me, you have Robert, you have each other. And when you come up with questions, which may not be answered in the book, may not be answered in the, in the lecture, then you write them down and you ask them. You ask them to, to people. Um, and you ask them to me, you post them on Piazza, you, you email us. And that's exactly what, what I do. So like in, for example, I have a grant with um, uh, Ardem Patakutian at uh, Scripps Research, Research Institute, who won the Nobel Prize in 2001, or sorry, 2021. Or the discovery of the protein in the in the uh, nervous system that responds to touch in neurons, and I bring my questions to this Nobel Prize winner, and they're very basic questions uh, to to him, and I have to get over <laughs> like my embarrassment at asking rather basic questions about about his field. But it's worth it. It's totally worth it. Because not only are they going to ask answer the question that you that you ask, 
but they're also going to express to you the way that they think about that that problem or that question, and it kind of deepens your uh, your your understanding and the fun you can have with that material. The other thing you can do is uh, is uh, bullet out the chapter. And these two can kind of be combined, bulleting out the chapter, jargon-free explanations. And by active process, I kind of mean treating treat, uh, treat the text as a murder mystery. So like those crime dramas, like, I don't know if anyone watches Law and Order anymore, <laughs> but uh, if you turn on the right cable channels, you'll get like 10 episodes of Law and Order in a row because the show has been around for so long. And like, you'll have characters like energy and force, and what's the motivation of energy and force and entropy? And then if you try to put this stuff together and you try to, uh, you know, personify these uh, these aspects of the material that you're you're learning. Uh, you'll not only retain it better better because of what neuroscientists call uh, semantic uh, memory. Psychologists call semantic memory, which means putting that memory in context. Uh, but you'll also have more fun with it, and the more fun you have with it, the less you'll dread it the easier it will be to ignore distractions and so forth. So this is like, this is, this is, this is a, a solid approach. The next, the next piece is like, um, is what are the life hacks? One is, One is metacognition. Metacognition is thinking about how you think. And there's a realization that uh, you may not be at your best in the early morning, or you may not be at your best late at night, or you might not be best at 2.30 after lunch when you feel like falling asleep or taking a nap. Um, and there are some tasks that are that you can put into those like those times when it just takes a lot, a lot of energy to get something out of it. And then there are, there are times of day where you know you're the strongest or the most creative, where you can breeze through a task relatively, or you feel like you have a lot of concentration at a particular time. And that's where I would put, like, this stuff. Okay, so um, let's call them let's call them good times and bad times. And good times um, easy to concentrate. Good times, bad times, a good Led Zeppelin song, but anyway, bad times, uh, hard to concentrate. What do you do during the good times? During the good times, you do all this stuff. What is left for the bad times? Go to sleep. You've already slept. Let's say you've already slept. Oh. For the bad times when it's hard to concentrate, assuming you've already slept. Assuming you've already slept. Flash cards. Uh, isn't that like a hundred percent of your time? Or unless there's medium times. There might be medium times. Okay. Time is what we'll talk about in a second. Flash cards. If you can 
if you can make these things on flashcards, like literally buy some stacks of three by five inch index cards and put the stuff on there, then you can use this time, uh, you can leverage the, the investment you've already made here. Okay, this is looking like a lot of time. We have 16 units or 18 units for 12 units or 20 units and a job and sometimes a family and a long commute. So what are we gonna, how are we gonna make this happen, right? The first thing is to put your phone in a box <laughs> or a drawer or turn it all the way off or put it in another room. Give it away. <laughs> give it away, give it away, give it away now. Okay, two uh, rock tunes. Uh, that's very hot chili peppers. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you give, you do something with your phone or your iPad or your laptop that make it hard for you to distract yourself with it. So, like, I read somewhere that most Americans never even have to get up to check their phone for 23 and a half hours a day. Where even when you're walking around at home in your like house clothes or PJs, <laughs> it's in your pocket, usually in my pocket. Do I feel good about that? No. <laughs> but it is definitely a thing if you can create some kind of like barrier, because we're all lazy, right? Sometimes the laziness against studying or active learning might be smaller than the barrier to go find your phone if it's in a drawer, <laughs> or even if you've turned it all the way off. And the last one I'll say, is the Pomodoro technique is, some of you have heard this in like productivity, uh, like if you're into productivity hacks, the Pomodoro technique is based on those tomato shaped kitchen timers where you just twist it to 25 minutes and you don't check your email, you don't check social media, you don't, eat, you don't get up, and you just focus on the task for 25 minutes. And you find as you start to get into a flow state and you're doing this active process, by the way, the magic of this active process is that you typically don't have to reread the same paragraph five times. If you read it slowly and carefully, once, you usually get what there is to get out of it. So are you like looking up the words in the dictionary every time you know something you don't understand? Yes. Like, but as you go, the more you learn, the more you know from a, from the end paragraph, the less there is to learn from the n plus one paragraph. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Does this apply to like literature? I'm doing like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> yes, it applies to literature as well. I have Hume's treatise that I'm like, oh, smart people read Hume, and they read like a page. And I didn't say that. Um, okay, so those 25 minutes, if you're having like fun with the material, and the more you do it, the better at it you get, and the more fun it becomes. Those 25 minutes you'll find will pass quickly. And then you set the timer for five minutes, and you do anything you want, anything you want. Then you set it to 25 minutes again, and you do the what they say is you do two hours like this, and that's one Pomodoro. You do four of these cycles, and then you do whatever it is you're going to do for the rest of the day, and you'll get way more out of those two hours of 
focused, active learning than you would out of uh, out of re just sitting there reading. Yeah. Uh, mm, no, I don't, I don't know about that. I didn't really retain any of that. Oh, what's what's on TV? Like that that kind of attention. Um, okay. The other thing I want to say is that this takes time. It takes it takes a lot of time. So when people self-report like on uh, course evaluations, the amount of time that they spend um, in a in a course, like per week, and it might be six hours or eight hours outside of class or something like that. The the trick is to make those eight hours as eight hours as possible. Eight hours is pretty good in a class like nine or eleven. That would be that would be great if you could if you could put that that time in. You may not need that time. You may need more time, but make sure that though that time you're spending is is well spent. The other thing I want to say, and I really hope this doesn't come come off as preachy, but if you're working, if you're working. Know that a that success here is going to have a much, much, much bigger effect on lifetime or earnings potential than extra money in your pocket right now, even if it means you have to take out loans. I paid off my loans last year, uh, and it was not. It didn't feel. Great to have loans on the books for so long, uh, but in the end, that interest rate, even that compounded interest, um, was dwarfed by lifetime earnings potential, and a lot of that starts starts now. So that's my motivational speaker. But thank you for indulging me.